and welcome to the Pragmatic Product Chat series, where we tackle the biggest challenges facing today's product management, product marketing, and other market and data-driven professionals with some of the best minds in the industry. I am Rebecca Calajaris, Vice President of Marketing and Product Strategy at Pragmatic Institute, and your host for this episode. Today, we are joined by Carla Johnson, marketing and innovation strategist and author of Rethink Innovation, among several other books. Uh, welcome, Carla. Thank you, Rebecca. It's so great to be here. I appreciate you having me. Oh, it's very excited to have you on. I think uh, innovation is something that every product person strives to be, right? To solve real market problems with really innovative solutions that the audience embraces is, is, a, is a dream, right? It is the goal right? for all yeah. of us. I agree. So for our listeners who have maybe not had the pleasure of talking to you before, Carla, can you give us just a little bit of background about you and, and what it is about innovation that really draw you to, drew you to the topic? Absolutely. So my background is I actually started in university as an electrical engineer and ended up with a master's in history. So you think about two majors that couldn't be more opposite ends, I guess. But along the way, one of my first jobs was doing marketing for architecture firms. And that was so foundational in how I looked at everything that I did particularly marketing. And what I learned, especially from design architects, is how to look at what's the emotion that we want to create from mm -hmm. how a person interacts with our product, how they experience a launch, how they interact with the brand or whatever it may be. And then looking at how do we reverse engineer that journey so that we then understand what we need to do now so that we can have that happen. And that's really been foundational for what I did in marketing and now moving into innovation and really looking at that idea of how do we architect innovation to create the kind of outcomes that we want and understanding how to go from those outcomes and reverse engineer it into the work that we need to do every day to get there. I think that's really interesting too. I don't think we necessarily always think about the connection between innovation and emotion and what we're trying to, to, to deliver there. So I think that's, that is super interesting to dig into as well. All right. So when we talked about innovation, I think a couple of things here, we're talking not just about like the one time innovation, like that inspiration that hits and you have the one great idea, but how do you build a discipline of innovation among yourself, but also a culture of innovation within your organization? Uh, and I know you talk a lot about how that works, and I would love to get your perspective on that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things that we really need to rethink about innovation is what it is and who owns it. So if we think about innovation in most organizations, we think that there's this group over here that you know has a special space, the special team, the special title, the special skills, and they are the you know quote innovators, and they're the ones who who hold the responsibility, accountability, and kind of pleasure of innovating within a company. And when you approach innovation in that way as a company, and you ask anybody else outside of that group to think about how they can be more creative thinkers, how they can think differently, maybe a little more innovatively about the work that they do, one of two things happens. The first is that a person will say, oh, that's not my job because that's the innovations group's job. And they don't want to run afoul of them. They don't want to step on people's toes. And so they're like, that's that's just not my thing. Or the other one is, you know, I'm not really smart enough. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a design thinker. I'm not, uh, you know, anthropologist or, you know, some of the new types of disciplines that are coming into innovation and design thinking. And so essentially what happens is that you have a small group who is overburdened, even if they want to be able to help innovation be driven across the organization, but they can't do it. So you have a small group who's trying to deliver these incredible outcomes, not only from the product perspective, but, or, you know, service line, if that's the area of innovation, but also People are looking to them, how do we become a more innovative company from a cultural perspective? How do we teach people these skills? And you know, in, in their defense, there's only so, so much they can do in a day, just like the rest of us. But if you look at companies that are truly high performers, they really understand that innovation is everybody's business. And in fact, 90% of innovation happens outside of traditional product and service line development. 
yet 75% of financial investment goes into that little 10% Mm -hmm. of what we traditionally think of innovation. And so when we look at that, we have this incredible opportunity to really create a culture of innovation, you know, back to my time with the architects to architect a culture where innovation really is everybody's business. And people approach their their everyday work with that kind of mindset and behavior. And that's one thing I'd like people to really rethink is that innovation isn't something that you have to pile on as a to-do on top of everything else that you do all day, every day. It's really a mindset and behavior about how you do the work that you're already doing. So when you talk about it not being like a separate thing, right? But that's something that's just, it's sort of how you approach what you do. What are some tips or tricks or tools that people could use to kind of help uh, awaken that way of thinking, awaken that mindset and as they work? Yeah, and it's a great question, Rebecca. And it's one that I spent a lot of time researching for my book, Rethink Innovation, because one of the consistent things that I heard, even from people who really wanted to be innovative or or more creative thinkers, is that they said, you know, I'm just not that kind of person. And Mm -hmm. and it's like, you know, they think of the creative people as the, you know, the artists or the painters or somebody who can write or sing or perform in that way. And they think of the innovators as these very, you know, structured design thinkers, PhD kind of people. And there's this big gap in the middle of people who think they, who who don't believe they're either side. And so they don't believe that they're innovative. <clears throat> and so what I wanted to do with my book, Rethink Innovation, is to really dig into how do these super creative, innovative people think? And what is it that helps them consistently come up with great ideas over a long period of time And these ideas have an impact because innovation is more than just a one and done. You know, you think of the one hit wonder in the music world. We have the same kind of people in innovation. So how do we build that consistent, sustainable track record of great ideas that lead to the innovation? And that's where I realized as I went through the interviews of the people and looking at their performance and how they thought and what they did, they all followed the same process, whether they realized it or not. Hmm. The first, it's a five-step process. And it starts out being more observant to the world around you, distilling what you observe into patterns, relating those patterns into the work that you do. And then only at the fourth step do we do what people typically start with, and that's generating ideas. And then fifth is pitching and learning how to pitch them. And so if we look at how somebody can be more innovative on a day-to-day basis, you know, we all have hobbies and we all have interests, right? One of my big interests is architecture. So as I look at the work that I do, I think of it in terms of how would an architect do this? Like if an architect were building a, you know, a strategy for innovation, how would they approach it? And it really helps open up my my thought process and it helps open up my what I believe is possible and how things could be done, because that's one of the places that I draw it from. I'm also a big fan of history. So I read experiences and stories about you know, people in different cultures, times and places. And it really starts to get the ball rolling as I observe more of what they do. I start to look at these patterns. And then I start to think about how can these patterns relate to what it is that I'm doing. And when we look at innovation, oftentimes we think we have to hit the pause button on our day-to-day work, go innovate, come back and do our day-to-day work. But it really can be as simple as saying, you know, who's a company that you really admire? You know, what if, what if your company approached a product launch like Lego does? What would that look at? what would that look like? And then start, you know, observing what does Lego do? What are the patterns that you see? And it's not that you have to cut and paste a product launch and do it exactly like Lego did, but what are those patterns that you see that they're really great at? Is it building community? Is it, you know, building excitement? Is it, you know, something about going way bigger and bolder than you ever could have imagined, like their Hollywood movies? It's really looking at what you do from that different kind of lens with what inspires you and excites you about, you know, the life you live every single day. But I think what I like about that too, is often, you know, when we're thinking about products, we look at what our competitors do or something like that to see if there's things we could, we could learn. And and that's, you know, it's always good to, to track your competitors to some extent, but what I like here is, is you're finding something people are passionate about anyway, whether it's architecture and history or 
Legos, which I am a big fan, and using that lens to just to, to remind yourself to kind of break through your thought patterns, to think about things differently and open up your way of thinking, which I think can be powerful. And to your point, it's not necessarily, it, it doesn't have to be a long exercise. It doesn't have to be diverted. It's just, oh, okay. So now I'm going to do a little even thought break, right? We all, you know, if you take a, a, a break for lunch and you think about that lens while you go through, or I'm a big shower thinker, right? So uh, all of those are great places to play little mind tricks. And I think it's, it's, it's shocking how powerful even the, the little bit of time you think about those things can be. Um, and it's a good lesson that it's not, you know, it doesn't have to be a two week innovation escape trip. It can just be, you know, trying to look at it from a different seat or different point of view. It is. And, and it can be as simple as plant the seed and go for a 20 minute walk. And you'll be amazed at what your brain does because this process is very, it's very genetically sound. It's, it's based in neuroscience and how our brain naturally works. I mean, you and I are here today, Rebecca, because our, you know, predecessors, our ancestors were really observant and they could look at patterns in the environment and, you know, see all of those different things that they observed and distill them into patterns. Was it safety or was it danger? And then they could change their behavior or, you know, keep it the same accordingly, you know. And so we're wired to observe the world around us and to find these patterns by distilling what we see. But most of the time, we don't do that naturally because we're, I don't know about you, but here's my phone, you know, right, right. in my arm. So we've taught our brain to shut off this natural ability to observe because we narrow our focus all day long on our phone, on our computer, you know, on our tablets, whatever it may be. But really just getting outside or looking at something further away that expands your visual range, little tricks like that are enough to start to spark that natural part of your brain. Well, and it, I mean, I think one of the traits we always talk about making a great product person is curiosity, right? And it's this kind of piece where you're where you're wondering about how things work or go. And and another thing that you talk about that reminds me so much of what we teach. We have this concept called Nihito, right? Which is nothing important happens in the office, and all it is is meant to remind people that you have to get out of the office. You got to go observe your market, your, your people, your customers. And, you know, it's been a little bit harder with COVID, but there is something again about really being in their environment and seeing how things interact and the different types of questions you would ask, because what the behaviors people report are often very different than what they actually do. Right. And so that all that being goes, we all want to look good, right? Right. Exactly. You're like, no, I would never do that. And like, yeah. And so it's such a, a powerful, it's one of the most powerful things we can do is observe and observe in quantity. So you're not just taking one point of view. And then as you said, to find those patterns. Those for us, when we think about products, are the market problems we want to solve. Like that is where we're seeing something that the market, you know, a place that we can have an impact on our, on our uh, customers and our, and uh, through our products, which is always the place we want to be. It is. An, and I remember early in my career going on site with a, a client for the architecture firm I worked for. And I had talked to this person on the phone eight, 10 times and, you know, said, asked all my questions and this and that, but I really, I didn't feel like it was there yet. And this was a children's hospital. It was a administrator for a children's hospital. And within the first 30 minutes, I said, wait a minute, why did you just do that? And he explained it to me. And I said, why didn't this ever come up in any of the conversations that we've had over the phone, you know, over the last six months? And he goes, oh, I didn't think it mattered. Yep. But, and so had I not been there and been able to really truly observe and pay attention. And like you said, be curious, I would have missed it altogether. And mm -hmm. understanding that part of his day was a big pivot point in what we did next. Yeah. The other thing that you talk about in your book uh, and that you talked a little bit about here is, you know, the idea that there are special people who are innovative or even a specific type of person, right? That we have this model of, you know, people who are innovative look like this. Uh, and you really talk about that there are multiple types of personalities and they all have the ability to influence and create a culture of innovation and they come at it through very different lens. And I just think this is fascinating and I loved it. And I, I want to talk about it a little bit more. And then you also have like an assessment that helps you figure out your type. And it was 
spookily accurate uh, <laughs> as to like the, the 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 pluses and the minuses, and it was it was really interesting to see how the different roles uh, talk about innovation. So you can set that up a little bit, toss talk through the different types of innovation innovators and why that matters and how we should think about that from a from a culture perspective. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to because you know back to people telling me. I'm not an innovator. I'm not a creative thinker. And, and there's research. It was, um, there's some, a study that it came across that was done of George Land. And George Land was a systems engineer in the late 1960s. And he left his engineering job and started, interestingly enough, a consultancy about creativity. And early on, one of the directors of NASA came to George and said, we have really, really creative engineers. I know we do. We just can't figure out which ones they are. And so he hired George to do this assessment to be able to root out who these really creative thinking engineers were. Now, George went back to his office after the work was done and he said, now you look at kids and they're just like heads are exploding with so many amazing creative ideas. What happens between the age of five and 55 that makes creativity either unidentifiable or not something that exists in adults. And he took that assessment that he did of the NASA engineers and, and adapted it. And then he gave it to 1,600 five-year-olds. And the interesting thing was 98% of these five-year-olds registered at the genius level of creativity. So you think, Rebecca, you and I came from this, unless you and I are the two of the, <laughs> of the statistics oh, that didn't make the cut. <laughs> you know, so, so this is something that at age five, we are geniuses in creativity. But he said, you know, there's still a big gap between five and 55. And so he took this same group of students and he followed them for the next 10 years and he measured them at age 10. And the difference in their performance between age five and 10 was phenomenal. And in fact, it dropped to only 33% of these students measured at that genius level at age 10. But I think what's even more sad is by age 15, it had dropped to 12%. And so uh -huh. what happens during that time between five and 15, a whole lot of school. And we're taught that what you did as a child, oh, that's fine if you're a kid. But you're in the real world now, like you're growing up, you need to be more responsible, you need to be more mature, you're going to go off to college, you can't do that anymore. And so it's taught and rewarded out of us, not only in the edu most educational systems, but also in university and then in the career world. You know, there's how many times have we heard from companies and leadership? Oh, absolutely. It's fine to fail. Like we embrace failure. And then it's as if there's this little asterisk that says, as long as you don't actually fail. Right. And so, right, we, we grow up learning this mixed message of, you know, we celebrate people who do fail as long as they eventually win and win big. And, and when we look at that, what I wanted to do with my archetype assessment is help people understand there's no one type of person who's the right type of person to innovate. Now, there's two of the, of the um, archetypes who, who we're pretty familiar with. One is the strategist, and they're the people who are naturally great at strategy and planning and understanding that through line. You know, they can see when an idea happens. Mentally, they've already laid the papers and they can understand how it gets out the door. And those people are so valuable. And I think on the other end of the scale are the provocateurs, and they're the ones who are always pushing, pushing, pushing the envelope. You know, with somebody like a Steve Jobs, really not willing to accept the status quo. And if you get a strategist and a provocateur in the same meeting, you, you really see this because a strategist is like, how are we going to get this done? We need to think this through. And the provocateur is going like, like, don't be so rigid. Like, let's just really play and, you know, see what's possible here. And there's a lot of headbutting there. But there's four other archetypes that I developed. Um, one is, you know, back to understanding the customer, the psychologist. And the psychologist real ha really has empathy for what it's like to be a customer of an idea. You know, is this going to help their world be a better place? Mm -hmm. if, we, if we execute this idea, is it going to run smoothly for them? You know, because there's a lot of ideas that may have been good in the little initial phrase, but when you go through the execution, it can be kind of a nightmare. 
And then we also have um, the collaborator. And the collaborator is someone, if you think about being able to, to reach across all different silos, different teams, they naturally bring people together. And they're the kind of person who isn't out for their personal glory and what they, you know, what they can be there for and really earn kudos for. They really care about the idea and its success and making it better all the way through and you know, making sure that it does achieve its full potential. Then we have a culture shaper and a culture shaper really is one of those people who is fantastic at communicating change. And when you think about innovation and even product launches, they're about change in how things are done, what people will do. And this is where we really have seen the rise of the storyteller. I think great innovators are also great storytellers because they can paint that picture and help people believe in that future state. And then the last of the six archetypes is the orchestrator. And the orchestrator is someone who's really a fearless leader. They're willing to have those difficult conversations early in the process so that they can avoid hurdles, headbutting, friction, anywhere, you know, anything like that down the road. They're able to really maneuver the political stepping stones in an organization. And they're just, they're very, very, they're excellent, excellent leaders. And so I'm curious, Rebecca, for you going through the assessment, what was your archetype? So it's funny because when you, when you, when you go through all six, and I'm sure I'm not the only one here, like I think we hear parts of ourselves in all of them, right? So if you had, if you'd asked me ahead of time, what I would have, I would have come up with. I, I'm not sure I would have guessed right, uh, but I, I did come out as a provocateur, which was interesting to me. And I think the part that that read the most, like the part that I went, oh gosh, this is definitely the right one. There is a line in sort of the, the, the profile that comes up that is like something along the lines of you may have accomplishments, right? And, and, and realize goals in a role that's not a perfect fit for you, but it will exhaust you over time and I was like oh yeah I've been there right like like but not the role I'm now which uh, very much feeds feeds me but like that line I went oh right because and I I don't know if this is exactly why but but there is an emotion to the creativity right when, it, when I'm having ideas and I'm brainstorming I love I love like freeform brainstorming I'm very comfortable there and it and it it sparks me uh, and when I have other roles that are, of which I'm very capable of, of doing big plans and rolling things out and I can do it and it's great, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't give me the little spark piece. So yes, that's what I was. You, you and I are two peas in a pot because I'm a provocateur as well. Oh, excellent. And, and, and that's, and it's an interesting thing because what you start to notice, like you just talked about your behavior and that's a difference between a role and an archetype. Mm -hmm. is that a role is a job title, a job position. And just like you said, you had these job positions, but they weren't true to your archetype, at least in, in that culture, whatever the situation was. But when we think of an archetype, if we think about, you know, who's an idea person? Oh my gosh, let's go ask Rebecca because she'll figure it out. And that's because it is your natural behavior to be that idea person. So where teams really struggle is when they have job titles and job roles and then have preconceived ideas mm. about what that behavior could, should be. You know, should it be a strategist? Should it be somebody who can plan and execute? Well, what if it's a culture shaper and they are an amazing mm. storyteller? You know, there's, there's all these different cues to it. And so when we look at this and then back to the dynamics of teams and even looking at ideas, when you said you could kind of see yourself in a lot of them, one of the reasons is because you have performed as if you were a strategist or storyteller or um, culture shaper, things like that. And so people who are well-versed and flexible in how they need to behave in order to fill in gaps on teams often find that when they go through the assessment, they really resonate with many of the different characteristics of the different archetypes. But when you go through, and, and sometimes people will go through it and they might come out with, you know, a different archetype, you know, one, one or, you know, two, they may come out with, you know, two different archetypes if they retake it. But what that can be sometimes is the role that they have at that time. Like I have a friend who is definitely 
an orchestrator, but she took it about six months ago again, and she came out as a culture shaper. And that was very reflective of the work that she was very, very deep in at the time. So, you know, if, if you take it more than once and it changes, that can be a reason why. Well, and you do. I mean, I think one of the things it talks about is, is the advantage of having all of these archetypes and multiple ones, because you need all those pieces. And Absolutely. I think, yeah. yeah. And you start to also, you know, it took me a while to realize lots of people don't love sort of unstructured brainstorming. Like it's really immensely uncomfortable for them. It is. It the is as draining. Yeah. It's as draining yeah. for them as structured work yeah. is for you. And it, I, I will get the least interesting ideas from them, right? But but that's just like it, it took me longer to realize that. And so, but you start to 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 change your ways because you do have lots of people, and that's a good thing. But it is true, like there is still that true north place. It's like you just give me a whiteboard and let's go for it. And I'm in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's also important to think about this, you know, back to the architecture analogy. If the only people you had on a design and construction team was a design architect and you didn't have any structural engineers, you didn't have any electrical engineers, you know, mechanical engineers, interior designers, much less people who were experts at the construction part, you would have a team that fails. And yet we tend to believe that we need to have teams who have consistent characteristics but that often leads to failure on teams as well. But we don't understand why that is. Mm-hmm. But when you when you look at the most successful teams, they're they're very diverse. Whether it's you know architecture and construction, or sports, or you know innovation and creativity, music. You think about all the different types of people and instruments that are in you know a musical group, the Rolling Stones. You know, again, classic innovative performers like that. You wouldn't want everybody to be a Mick Jagger. No, no. And you, and you need all of those roles when you really talk about them. And one of the other things I found really interesting was, is it talks about when you recognize yourself, you can recognize others and think about then how best ways to, to, to partner together. Like where are your synergies going to really go and leverage that? And where should you think about the fact that they really hate unstructured brainstorming, right? Uh, and, it, and it's a good it's a good reflection point as well uh, and how to make sure all the voices are getting heard. It, it is. And one of the things, activities that I have people do when I do the archetype workshop with, with teams is that I have them stand, you know, just two, two people face to face and each person takes a turn. And, you know, I as a provocateur, even if I'm saying it to you as a provocateur, but ideally an archetype different from what you are. So I would stand in front of a culture shaper and I would say, what I need from you as a provocateur is, and just like say, what is it that I need? And it doesn't mean, here's what I need from you because you're this archetype. It's just like, here's what I need every day. I need my ideas to be heard. I, you know, I need... I need to have that voice. I need to not feel like I'm the crazy one in the room because I can't shut the ideas off. You know, I need I need some of these things, but I also need some boundaries. I need some help finding that through thread in a narrative if I'm trying to make this idea truly successful. You know, so so those are the kind of things that really build much more empathy amongst a team as well as cohesion and collaboration. Yeah. Right, because I, great ideas. Everyone needs the story that gets people bought in. Everybody needs the orchestration of all the places that are going to do it. Like all of these parts are key. And I, I love the idea of we can recognize these things. Like we can be more avo- overt about it. Right. We don't exactly. have to try and figure it out. It's like, oh, well, that's great. This would be super helpful if you did this. And I, you know, it's it's uh-huh. a it's a wonderful open space. Which I also think, again, trust is a place yeah. that innovation can can foster sometimes because it is a place where you're not there isn't that fake go ahead you can fail it's a real place where you can feel like I'm gonna throw out a dumb idea and no one here is gonna be like oh, that's well, and that's it. it's like all of a sudden you have a catch net around you and back to people say I don't have time to do innovation on top of everything else that I'm doing well you know what you don't have to if you understand these other archetypes and the strength that they bring and how you can just go to them, explain something to them. And I like, if somebody comes to you and me, Rebecca, and they're stuck on an idea, we'll give them 40 ideas and they're still (laughs) walking down the hall and we're chasing them, but wait, I'm not done. You know, why should they go through the pain and angst of trying to come up with it when they have somebody on their team 
where that's so natural. You know, it's the same thing with the other talents. And that's what, that's how we can really start to make innovation everybody's business when we understand how it helps people come together and produce better work. Love it. All right. You know what? I'm going to add in, I'm sure you do. Do you have an example either from your history or from people that you've worked with or, or, or know of, of kind of this innovation, the, the power that this sort of innovation approach and lens has had? Give me a good yeah. success story. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and it, it, I'm going to share this example because it is a product launch. And I think it is an example of how inspiration for this person really made a pivot in what this company normally did for a product launch. And it was just massively successful. So I have a friend, his name is Tim Washer, and he is um, he used to be the creative director um, for a, a group in Cisco. And every day when Tim went to work, you know, like a creative director does at a, you know, B2B, especially technology company, engineer driven, he had to figure out how to make boxes of wires and metal really attractive to customers they already had and new prospects. And I know like I've worked in tech firms and I've worked in B2B my whole career. Sometimes it can feel like you're doing the same thing as you did last year. You just dust it off, change the colors, change some words, you know, all right, cue up the engineer who designed this or cue up the executive and let's hear all the great things about it and, you know, why customers are going to want to buy it. And he, during this time when, when this product was going to launch, it was in the beginning of the year. He, he knew it was going to launch right around Valentine's Day. and he. Um, Interesting. He has an interesting background. He started out as a stand-up comedian and he wrote for Amy Poehler on Weekend Update. He worked with Conan O'Brien, Bill Nye, the science guy. I mean, he's, he's worked with the best of the best. And, you know, there, there came a time in his career when he had to choose between uh, the world of comedy and maybe something a little bit more reliable as he has his family started to grow. So that's why he went to the corporate side. But he was in a comedy club in New York City one night and Ray Romano was the comedian on stage. And he sat back and he started to, there's the first word, observe all of the people in the comedy club and Ray Romano. Now, Ray comes out on stage, you know, granted the audience has already warmed up just a little bit, but he starts talking about the things that matter most to the audience. He's talking about marriage. He's talking about spouses, in-laws kids, you know, the, the salt and vinegar that goes along with a lot of those things. But he made it so relatable through humor and things that would normally make people pull their hair out. They were, he, Tim saw people like physically leaning forward and laughing. And he said, Ray Romano was able to make this almost immediate emotional bond with the audience through humor. And as he was sitting there and that that's the patterns that he started to distill from what he observed was this ability to build a, an, an emotional connection, to get people to put their emotional walls down, to begin to lean in and listen, um, to be more lighthearted with what they were hearing and interacting within a conversation. And he started to ask himself, how can I relate to that's the third step? How can I relate these principles into this product launch that I'm looking to do at Cisco. And it was only after going through the observe, distill and relate phase that he looked to generate an idea. Now, typically what we do is if we need an idea for our product launch, we get on a call or we get in a meeting and we say, all right, we're gonna brainstorm ideas. I mean, this is if we're not going to dust off what we've done before. We wanna brainstorm ideas and everybody come together and remember there's no such thing as a bad idea. Rebecca, you and I know that a lot of those ideas are really bad ideas, <laughs> you know, and then you pitch them. And even if you try something really new and unique and different, it, it there's no context for it and you hear no. And so you end up going back and pulling off the shelf what you've already, you know, you've always done and nothing feels new, unique or fresh. It's kind of sucked a little bit more of your soul out. But what Tim did is he took these things that he had observed and instilled and he related it into his work. And he said, you know, what if we used humor to be able to build rapport? What if we used humor to get people to laugh about, you know, buying technology, you know, about things that normally people are very serious about? 
And that was the inspiration for the product launch video that he released. And I know that you, you have it to play. How many ways can a man tell his sweetheart, I love you? Until now, the answer was three. He could buy her expensive diamonds. He could take her on a tropical vacation. Or he could carve his initials into a tree, then carve a heart, and then carve her initials. But now, he can give her the ultimate expression of his everlasting affection. The Cisco ASR 9000. Because nothing says forever, like up to 6.4 terabits per second. Nothing says commitment, like up to 400 Gbps per slot. And nothing says I love you, like six times the mobile backhaul capacity. How many ways can a man say I love you? The answer is four. The Cisco ASR 9000. So as you can see, like nobody thinks that Valentine's Day is about buying your your love of your life an ASR 9000 router, but somehow Tim Washer made it work. Now, a really interesting thing about this is that they didn't do a big splash when they released it. They just put it on YouTube, told the sales team about it and let it go from there. And in the first week, they had about 250,000 views on YouTube. Now, if you think about a video going viral, that's nothing to write home about. But in their world where it was a very specific audience, that was huge. But what Tim also saw is that the sales team came back and they said, this video is amazing because what we're doing is going into meetings with customers and prospects. So, and they would say, we have this product launch coming out. Let me, let me show you something about it. And they would play the video and everybody in the room is laughing and it's a whole different energy and dynamic. And laughter is something that really builds an intimate connection in a short amount of time. And in some cases, the salespeople were saying, our customers were telling us things that we had never heard before. And they've been our customers for years. And it was because of that ability to, to laugh and be very human together in a room at the same time that they you know, began to open up. And one of the things that Tim never could have imagined would be an outcome that came out of this is that the media and analysts picked it up. And where do buyers go to do their due mm -hmm. diligence? If they're looking to buy a product, they go to the media and they go to analysts. And these were people who were saying, you have to check out Cisco because one, they're saying that a Valentine's Day gift is an ASR 9000 router. I don't think your spouse or a significant other would agree, but check them out because it's funny, it's witty, it's very, very human. And this is an interesting aspect for a technology company to be so human. And these are the kind of results that if Tim had started out with a typical brainstorming session to generate ideas, if he said, we want this to be something that absolutely gets media and analyst attention, I guarantee that wouldn't have been the product, the, the product launch approach is to use a comedy video around Valentine's Day. But because Tim started from a place of inspiration and he understood how to connect the dots into the work that he did, that's why he was able to come up with something that was truly unique and different. And I love the fact, uh, first of all, it's a, it's a great ad, but I also, I love the fact that like it happened when he was out on a night enjoying himself, right? He didn't like force said, it. Yeah. Just open it up and you, you know, if, like they say, innovation strikes at all kinds of places. And, and it's, it's a great way of, of letting your mind drift and solve problems. It is. It's, it's a, being curious about what you're observing. And then, you know, to a little bit, you plant the seeds and your mind just runs with it because this, this really is how our mind works when we give it the freedom and the space to do it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Carla, we talked about lots of different things today. Uh, if you were going to have our listeners do two things differently tomorrow, based on what would be on what we talked about today, what would it be? I think the first one is truly to go out and be more observant to the world around you. That's the very first one. And, you know, go sit in a park and just watch what happens. Watch the animals. If there's kids there, watch the kids. Watch the interaction between parents and kids. Like, go someplace that's very different from where you spend your day every day and observe what goes on around you. And I think the other one that I would do is if you're looking, even if you're looking at your competitor's work, really ask yourself, do I actually like this? 
Because what I see happen with companies is that they spend so much time looking into what their competitor is doing. And to be honest, they, they do what I call copy and waste it, copy mm-hmm. and, instead of copy and paste. They, they copy it, but they end up wasting an opportunity to really show up different and uniquely in front of their, their, um, their own audience. And so like dig into what is it that you think you like? Do you actually like it? Or are you just on this hamster wheel of they're doing it so we have to also? But, you know, nobody stands out by just copying what the competition does year after year after year. If you really want to surprise and delight your customers and your audience, you really have to look for inspiration outside of your industry. Great. Carla, this was great. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, For those people who are listening, I absolutely recommend that you check out her book, Rethink Innovation. And Carla, is it all right if we drop the assessment link for their- their Absolutely, absolutely. Perfect. I will put that in the description for everyone. It was was very eye-opening. But really, thank you so much for your time today, Carla. I'm delighted to be here. And I always encourage people when they take their archetype assessment, tweet it out, share it on LinkedIn, Mm -hmm. send me a note, connect, let me know how you found it. And if you feel that it describes you and what you kind of realized about yourself, it can be pretty eye-opening, just like you said, Rebecca. Great. All right. That does it for today's episode. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And don't forget to join us next week when we tackle another great topic designed to help you elevate your product, your company, and your career.